Good morning. It is so good to see you this morning. We are excited that you are here with us at First Baptist Waynesville. I'm Reverend Christy Hollifield, and I'm one of the ministers here at First Baptist Waynesville. We welcome you here today. We are excited about our Easter program, The Journey of Hope, or Journey to Hope, and we hope that you will enjoy and just relish in this wonderful opportunity to savor this season of Easter. If you are a visitor with us this morning, we welcome you. Please complete your visitor information tab located in your bulletin. You can detach it and place it in one of the offering boxes. We have one located at the back of the sanctuary at the door, and then one beside each of these doors up here. We would love to learn more about you and to connect you in different ways to the various activities that go on here at our church. Also, after our worship this morning at 1115, you can walk across the hall through these exit doors over here and head over to our Connections Coffee House. We have um, sweet treats, wonderful um, things to drink, and then a wonderful opportunity for a time of fellowship before we head to our small group lessons. If you're interested in a small group session, we also have a listing of all of our small groups located beside the door to the Connections Coffee House. Or you can ask one of us and we will be happy to direct you to a um, small group session for you. This morning, we will be partaking in the Lord's Supper. Did everyone receive a packet this morning? If you did not, please raise your hand. We will make sure that you um, have one. So if you have not received a Lord's packet or a Lord's Supper communion cup, please let me know and we'll be happy to, to get one for you. Okay, we have a few right down here, and there's some over here, yes. If you'll just keep your hands raised so we can ensure that you will have it. It will be directed to you when the time is to come for us to participate in the Lord's Supper. Our communion cups are um, a little different than what we've used in the past. If you'll notice at the top, you have one section that is for the bread. When it comes time to take the bread, you will simply remove your top portion and then the bread will, will come out into your hand. When the time is, comes for us to drink the juice, you will just simply flip your cup over and open up that tab and then you can drink from there. Everyone have a communion cup now? Wonderful, wonderful. Well, again, we welcome you here to First Baptist Church. We look forward to our wonderful morning of worship together. Let us join together right now in prayer as we begin our worship together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, this day to be able to come together in your house to worship through music and word. Lord, we pray that your spirit move around, among us, that you open our hearts and minds to the lessons and the, the ideas and the concepts that you would have us to carry forth in this week ahead. We love you and we praise you and we thank you for all that you are and all that you do and all that you have for us. Amen. People keep asking me who I am. Well, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as the prophet Isaiah said. I am not the Christ or even Elijah but come to baptize with water any who will repent from their sin and turn to the Lamb of God for forgiveness. And He is among you. He has a higher rank than me, and I am not worthy to untie His shoelaces, because He is the Son of God who will take away the sin of the world. I didn't recognize Him until God the Father told me that the Spirit would descend and remain on Him. But I have seen that Spirit descend from heaven, looking like a dove and remaining on him. I have seen it. I can also testify that I heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, in him I take delight. Now, I can only baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I can only baptize you for repentance, but the one who comes after me is more powerful. He will change you from the inside out. Go to him, you who are weary and burdened, you who are lost and ruined by the fall of mankind. Don't wait to fix what you think is wrong with you, or you'll never, turn, never come to him at all. Be, but beware, you cannot make yourself good enough to earn what he offers. 
You will never achieve what the Creator God requires for heaven. But you can come to Jesus just as you are now because all He requires of you is that you recognize your need for Him. Repent of your belief that you can do it yourself. And then He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, cleanse you, and forgive you of your sins. Behold, the Lamb of God has come. Nathaniel, did you ever imagine being part of a group like this? Men and women of all ages, even children. And somehow families to support them. 
Others are outcast. Some are educated. Some are not. There are people with property and influence, and others that came with nothing but the hope that they have received from healing or, or freedom from spiritual oppression. And then there's the 12 of us that Jesus elected for a smaller group. What a motley crew we are. <laughs> I mean, really. Fishermen, a former tax collector, guys with radical political views, and then there's just you and me. Well, the one thing, maybe the only thing we all have in common is that Jesus told us all to follow him. But without you, my friend, I wouldn't have met him. I still remember that I was really skeptical about what you told me, that he was the one that Moses and the prophets talked about, especially after you said he was from Nazareth. You've always been skeptical about everything, so of course you were one to get snarky and ask if anything good has ever came from Nazareth. Yes, I'm still embarrassed. You should have seen the face that Jesus pointed, pointed you out as you walked up and said that you were an honest man, a true son of Israel. I still can't believe that you were even snarky to his face. I Man, I don't think anyone could have ever said, how do you know me, with any more sarcasm than you did. The bigger shocker was when he told me he saw me under a fig tree before you found me. There's only one fig tree for miles, and there are plenty of other trees I could have been sitting under. He was amazingly accurate. I just knew he had to be the son of God. I remember how he practically laughed at you and teased you for believing something so trivial. Basically making the biggest understatement of a lifetime. Even Jesus said, just wait, you're going to see much greater things than that, like the heavens opening up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Wow. We've seen him do many miracles, but I feel like there's something much more important coming, something big and maybe dangerous. Don't you feel it? Yes, but no matter what, I've decided to follow Jesus. Even if it means death. No turning back. No turning back. You can have all this world. Give, Give me Jesus. Jesus.
When I was 12 years old, I got sick. No one knew what to do. The doctors couldn't help, and my father was desperate. For 12 years, I was sick. No one knew what to do. I went to so many doctors, spending everything I'd received from my father, but the doctors couldn't help. I was desperate. Then, then he I heard, heard about, about Jesus. Jesus. My father believed that Jesus could heal me, so he went to town to find him. As a synagogue ruler, my father held a lot of power in our community, and he was always a proud man. So when I heard that he had bowed down to Jesus to beg for help, I was amazed. I was even more amazed that Jesus agreed to come with him. I had already endured so many years of torture at the hands of the doctors, only to get worse. And because of the bleeding, I couldn't participate in any religious or community events, which was humiliating and isolating. Jesus had healed so many. Surely he could heal me. But I had no pride left by the time Jesus came to my hometown. I just couldn't face him. So when a man in the crowd stepped forward to help beg for his daughter, for help with this daughter, I moved my way forward through the crowd to get close to him from behind. I spent my life, almost 12 years, focused on preparing myself for marriage and children. But that would have been lost, wasted. I spent 12 years grieving the marriage and children I would never have. My life was lost, wasted. I was, I was so, so afraid. afraid. When the crowd started to move, I quickly crouched down and reached for the fringe of his cloak. I just knew if I could touch his cloak, I would be healed. And I was right. I could feel it. One moment I was in pain, and then it stopped. They tell me that I died. I don't remember dying. I only remember being in pain, and then it stopped. Suddenly, Jesus stopped. He started looking around at the crowd and said, Someone touched me. I felt power go out of me. Who touched me? His disciples practically made fun of him because the crowd was so close that many people were touching him. But I was caught. I fell on my face in front of him and told him everything. And he said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. My mother said that even though someone told him that I was already dead, Jesus came anyway. He even told my father not to be afraid. Only believe. When he arrived at my home, he told the mourners to stop because I was only sleeping, and they actually made fun of him. But he took mom and dad and three of his disciples to my bed. He reached out to me, took my hand, and told me to get up. I, I am, am no, no longer, longer afraid. afraid. Because I reached for Jesus. Because Jesus reached for me. I, I have, have a future, future and, and I can, can walk, walk through, through any valley in peace because, because of, of Jesus. Jesus.
Mom, Dad, who's that man the donkey? Why is everyone shouting? Why are we waving tree branches? Who's that man on the donkey? That's Jesus, the teacher from Nazareth. He's been teaching and healing all over Israel. Some people say that he's the Messiah. I hope they're right. Well, and if he is the Messiah and we don't shout about it, well, then Habakkuk says the rocks will cry out. Did you hear that he raised a man from the dead just last week? I did. Wait a minute. In Hebrew school, we had to memorize a passage out of Zechariah about this. It goes, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding a donkey. Wow, buddy. If Jesus really is the king and our Messiah, this, this, this changes everything. that when you look at me, you don't automatically think of me as a disciple of Christ. But he calls me that. Oh, I'm well aware that women, you know, they, they aren't usually allowed to be disciples or students of anyone, especially. Especially in these days when women are not that important. But tonight I wouldn't be anywhere else. The Passover feast is always a special time, but spending it with Jesus and the disciples was particularly meaningful. You see, during the supper, Jesus got up from the table, set his cloak aside, and grabbed a towel. We were all looking at each other, trying to figure out uh, what he was up to. He is unconventional, as we all know. But when he got down on his knees and started washing the feet of the disciple closest to him, we were shocked. The teacher, the rabbi, the leader of any group does not wash his father's feet. We are supposed to wash his. And of course, none of us did. In fact, 
There were often discussions, even arguments, among the men in particular who were the greatest, who was the greatest or favorite disciple of all. So obviously none of them are going to wash each other's feet. And it's not something I ever thought about doing. Now you need to understand that there were a lot of us in the upper room. And he did not skip anyone, not even the women. So my mom was racing whether or not I should let him wash my feet. Then he got to Peter. (laughs) And he tried to stop him, truly. Peter basically asked Jesus what he was doing if it wasn't obvious. And with the patience and love that I've seen so many times, Jesus said to him, What I'm doing you will not understand now, but one day you will. And Peter jumped up and almost shouted, You will never wash my feet. I know that everyone in the room was thinking the same thing. And we were all just surprised as Peter When Jesus answered, if I don't wash your feet, you can't be a part of what I'm doing. Of course, in true Peter fashion, he said, then wash my hands. Wash my head too. I think some of us nodded in agreement subconsciously. But we learned early on that we should let Peter talk first because he always sticks his foot in his mouth. And the rest of us were probably thinking the same thing. Could be spared the embarrassment. But Jesus explained that wasn't necessary. Anyway, Jesus finished washing all of our feet, put his cloak back on, and reclined to the table. Then he said, Do you understand what I've done? You call me teacher and Lord, which is true. So if I wash your feet... You should also wash each other's. I gave you an example to follow. Do it. There was more, but these words still ring in my ears to this day. He, but he has called each of us to serve each other. Washing each other's feet. The slave's job. The lowliest job of all. And he... He did it for me. I think our next Sabbath meal is going to be different. Really different. I'm going to sit at the welcome table. Hallelujah, I'm 
This morning, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, we gather at the table with the Lord and each other. So this time I'd like to ask you to take your packet and hopefully you have one. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a blessing of the elements and then we'll share the elements together. So let's pray. Father, as we gather at your table, we gather as people of different ages, from different places, different points in life, but we gather in a sense of shared faith in you. We love you, God. We are grateful for the gift of salvation, grateful for your love for us, grateful for the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Father, at this time, we dedicate the elements of the supper, the bread and the, the fruit of the vine. And we pray, God, that as we partake of them, we'll do so humbly, confessing our sins, acknowledging our shortcomings, receiving your forgiveness, and sharing that forgiveness with each other. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please take the end that has the portion of bread with it. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Take and eat. Now open the portion that has the cup. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink. Leaving there, Jesus, as he so often did, went to the Mount of Olives. His disciples followed him. When they arrived at the place, he said, Be alert that you don't fall into temptation. Taking Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he fell into an agonizing sorrow. This sorrow, he said, is crushing the life out of me. Stay here and keep vigil with me. Going on ahead a little, he fell on his face and began to pray. Please, Father, if it's possible, get me out of this. But Father, not what I want. You, what, what do you want? Immediately, an angel from heaven was at his side, strengthening him, and he prayed on all the harder. Sweat like drops of blood fell from his face. He came back to the disciples and he found them sound asleep. Peter, he said, couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour? You're willing. You have strength in the Lord, one part of you. The other part is like an old dog, lazy, sleeping in the sun. He went back and he prayed the same prayer again. When he returned, again he found the disciples asleep. He said, couldn't you watch with me? A third time he came back. Are you going to sleep on and make a night of it? Get up. The betrayer is here. My time has come. I'm going to be handed over into the hands of sinners. Let's go and meet him.
When my son was born, I truly believed that he would help our people by bringing down our oppressors and exalting the humble of Israel. These are the prophecies that we've been taught, the promises of God for our people. But Jesus' work did not look like I expected. At times, I thought he had lost his mind because he continued to defy the religious leaders and disregard the laws of the Sabbath. He even talked about how he was going to have to suffer. And that didn't make any sense at all. You see, we've been taught that our Messiah would lead our nation into greatness and our enemies would be punished. And Jesus was supposed to be our Messiah. Isn't he? I thought so. When Joseph died, I depended a lot on Jesus. And I joined his disciples when his youngest brothers and sisters were grown. I have seen his miracles. I have heard his teaching. I do believe in him. But I do not understand what I'm witnessing now. He's been on trial throughout the night, then beaten and flogged. And now he has to carry he has to carry a Roman cross out of the city and up to the hill of Golgotha. He will die. The climb up this hill will be his last. And I don't understand why. But I choose to trust you. I choose to believe that you will make this right. That somehow this is in your plan and you will use my son for your glory. But God Almighty, please give my son your strength to walk this valley. Oh
My life has been dedicated to the Roman Emperor and his army since my youth. Death is no stranger to me. Enforcing the rule of the empire means I have seen the deaths of those who would oppose us, as well as witnessing the deaths of many comrades, superiors, and many subordinates. As I rose to the rank of centurion, I was assigned to the governor over Israel. I have served him by putting down rebellion and executing enemies of the state, death upon death. Today began like many days before. We executed three men, nailing them to crosses in typical Roman fashion. The first two men died as I had seen many times before, but the image of the third will stay with me forever. Instead of cursing or crying out to us, he prayed to his God, Father, forgive them. He called his God Father. Instead of crying out in anguish to his mother, he spoke to her and comforted her and told her she would be cared for. He even showed kindness to the stranger being crucified beside him. He prayed in his own language, and even though I did not understand the words he spoke, I felt their power. With his final words, it is finished. It was as if he died of his own choice. And grace felt like a gentle rain on a parched and withered creation. Today, death was different. Today, I witnessed the death of the Son of God.
John chapter 20. On the first day of the week, early in the morning, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while it was still dark. And when she saw that the stone had been rolled away, she ran to find Simon Peter and she found the other disciple, the disciple who Jesus loved. And she said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. And with that, Simon Peter and the other disciple went out. They were heading to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple outran Simon Peter and arrived at the tomb first. And stooping down, he looked into the tomb. He saw strips of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't enter the tomb. And following him, Simon Peter also came to the tomb and he entered the tomb. And he saw the strips of cloth lying there. He also saw the cloth wrapping, which had covered Jesus' head, it was not with the other cloths, but had been folded and set in a separate place by himself. And then the other disciple who had arrived first also entered the tomb. He saw these things and believed. But disciples still did not understand from the scriptures that Jesus must be raised from the dead. And the disciples left, went back to the place where they were staying. But Mary Magdalene, she remained standing by the tomb, crying. And while crying, she stooped and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head, the other at the foot, where Jesus' body had been placed. And the angel said to her, Woman, why are you crying? And she said, They've taken my Lord out of the tomb. I don't know where they put him. And while crying, she stood and turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And supposing he was the gardener, Mary said, sir, if you've removed the body, tell me where you put him. I'll take him away. And then Jesus just said to her, Mary. And Mary cried out in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means my teacher. And Jesus said, do not cling to me now, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go and tell my brothers that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene ran, and she had found the disciples, and she announced to them, I have seen the Lord. And she told them everything that he had said. And then that evening, the disciples were gathered together. They were indoors. They had locked the doors because they feared the Jews. But still, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace to you. And then he showed them his hands, the wound in his side. And the disciples rejoiced for they had seen the Lord. And Jesus again said to them, Peace to you. As my Father has sent me into the world, I also am sending you into the world. And having said this, Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. For if you forgive the sin of any, it will be forgiven. And if you retain the sin of any, it will be retained. One of the disciples, Thomas, who, who was called the twin, was not with the other disciples when Jesus had appeared to them. And so the other disciples were telling Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas says, well, until I have seen the mark of the nail in his hands and placed my finger into the mark of the nails and reached out my hand, placed it into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were again gathered together. 
Thomas was with them. The doors were closed. They were inside. The doors were locked. And again, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace to you. And then he said, Thomas, place your finger here. Observe my hands. Now, Thomas, reach out your hand. Place it here in my side. Thomas, do not be an unbeliever. Be a believer. And Thomas cried out, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed. Those who believe without seeing are blessed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these, these were written so that you may believe. You, you, you may believe. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. And by believing, you may have life, abundant life, eternal life in his name. To that we say, amen and amen.
Please be seated for just a moment. First of all, we want to express our appreciation and love to our orchestra. Let's show them our love. And to our choir, we appreciate them so much. Our tech crew, thank you so much. And also to Mitch, thank you for putting all this together. And our dramatists, and to Nina for putting that all together. Our Father and God, thank you for this wonderful celebration. Thank you for Easter and what it means. Thank you for your death and resurrection. And help us, Lord, to go out and both live and proclaim your gospel this week. In Christ's name we pray, amen.